1940, Hitler's armies drove through Europe. Only Britain held out against their assault. But the Nazis had a covert plan to undermine the British defenses. In a concentration camp north of Berlin, a secret weapon was rolling off the production lines. Its purpose? To strike silently and stealthily at the heart of the British Empire and invade every aspect of daily life. It was a weapon made of paper. At the height of World War II, the Nazis pulled off the greatest currency forgery in history, producing the equivalent today of over three billion pounds. The original plan was to produce very large amounts of, of British paper currency and drop it over Britain. Uh, some of the more honest members of the public would maybe have handed them into uh, banks or police stations, but generally the Germans were banking on the idea that uh, they wouldn't and it would cause huge inflation and de totally destabilize the, the, the currency and the British government. Hitler personally authorized the plan to flood Britain with fake currency, cause massive inflation and wreck the British war effort. To produce these forgeries, the Germans relied on a unique national resource. The Nazis had interred millions of Jews in concentration camps across Middle Europe. They gave the Third Reich a vast source of slave labor. And for a secret operation, they had one great advantage. When it was over, they could be killed. The head of the camp said to us, you should know here you're in Germany, there's nothing in France, here you work hard, and if you don't work, we send you to a place you go into the gate and come out of the chimney. The SS systematically trolled the camps for men with skills that could be used for counterfeiting. These men were living in terror, their lives forfeit to Hitler's final solution, witness to the daily violence and degradation of the camps. And then I said, what's going on? Everyone stood and just stared. <laughs> I saw my father lying on the ground, drenched in blood. He had been in the next row and everyone was pushing from behind and in the front they were beating. And one SS man had hit him in such a way on the head so that the head cracked open and he was lying, streaming with blood. In any event, he was dead. And I was really shaken by it. I just wanted to run into the wires, the electric wires. I blamed myself because I should have looked after my father better. But Jack Plappler was to be rescued by an unlikely savior, an SS major or Stummbannführer called Bernhard Kruger. A specialist in forging passports and other documents, this was the man who would give his name to the secret operation to wreck the British economy. He would recruit the workers and direct every aspect of their labor. He would be their keeper and, if necessary, their executioner. Kruger was as far removed from the Nazi ideal as you could possibly get. He was about five feet eight, receding hairline, a little pudgy, Certainly nothing like the idealized, blonde, blue-eyed, six-foot Nazi hero. Stubben für Kruger was a double-faced man. His appearance was distinguished, civil, well-mannered. However, his other side was a very devoted SS, a high-ranking SS, I would even say a murderer with a smile. Ruthless and energetic, Kruger set out to make Operation Bernhardt the deadliest weapon in the Nazi armory. But there was a more personal motive for his labors. Let's face it, he was very practical. This is one way of not being sent to the Russian front, which is murderous. Uh, 
So as long as he had this, he was safe. Kruger's main source of recruits was Auschwitz, the most notorious death camp in the Third Reich. Over the course of the war, two million prisoners would die here. Paul Londo was one of those paraded before the Nazi physician who made the selection for the gas chambers. It was very cold. We were told to undress entirely from a striped clothes. And as we passed in front of that physician, from time to time, picked up the arm and he asked you to show the number. And when your number was taken, you knew it means you were going to be gassed. That day, I was fortunately, I wasn't picked. And 2,000 Jews were uh, chosen to be gassed. Just two days later, Kruger arrived at Auschwitz and recruited Paul Londo with 54 other Jewish prisoners for a secret mission. We were assembled and took the train destination. We didn't know. They didn't advise us in advance where we were going to. We were taken to a concentration camp called Sachsenhausen, some six kilometers outside of Berlin. Sachsenhausen was to be the production center of Operation Bernhardt. Among the 140 prisoners who eventually worked here were four men who survived to tell a story never meant to be told. Hans Walter, professional cyclist and engineer, chosen for his metalworking skills and excellent eyesight. Abraham Krakowski, Clark, arrested with his fiancée and chosen by Kruger for his accountancy skills. Paul Londo, a furrier before the war, he led the Germans to believe he was a carpenter. And Jack Plappler, painter and decorator, chosen for his practical abilities. Suddenly an SS officer approached, a major with four stars. He shouted, so, where have my Jews been? His Jews. His Jews. That was us, the ones he had chosen. Sachsenhausen was a labor camp for political prisoners, homosexuals, gypsies, and Jews. Here, some 30,000 prisoners were forced to work for the Reich on the premise that work makes you free. But very few would leave Sachsenhausen alive. The Operation Bernhard recruits were isolated from the other prisoners in two separate blocks, a prison within a prison. Barbed wire was extended around our block and not in communication with anybody else in the camp. We knew from the beginning something suspicious there, but we coming from Auschwitz had nothing to lose. You could not see inside the barracks because the windows were whitened. So you could look out of the windows, but from outside you couldn't see what was happening within. None of the 140 prisoners were recorded at the camp's registry office. It was as if they had disappeared inside the camp. The barracks looked just like the others, only with the slight difference that there were printing machines inside. And there was a guarded cordon to make sure that we did not get out or approach the fence where we could have spoken to the other prisoners because they were certainly curious to know what was going on inside here. Before revealing their new role in the Nazi war effort, Kruger made the alternative perfectly clear. If you don't do the job, he told us it was a secret job, we had to be uh, eliminated, shut outside, and uh, he don't do the job, but he got people to do it for him. So... Uh, 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 nobody of us, 60 people that came from Auschwitz, uh, put his hand up and said he wouldn't do the job, but uh, he assigned us to. So we took the job. Bernhard Kruger, Bernhard Kruger spoke to us. Well, comrades. Kameraden. Suddenly we were comrades. You have been chosen. We have something in mind for you. You are all specialists, good printers, good engravers. You are to work on these printing machines. 
And then we were given these printing plates from Berlin, and we printed British pound notes. Kruger had set these men a challenge, make forgeries that will fool the Bank of England or die. Like it or not, the Jewish prisoners were now helping Kruger to produce the secret weapon that the SS believed would wreck the British war effort. And when the job was done, they would be shot. We didn't cooperate, we knew it was our end. So we were better treated than in Auschwitz, for sure. But we are still in a concentration camp, and we knew as long as they need us, they might treat us almost normally. But God forbid if they don't need us anymore. Frightened? Just be very, be very used to it. We got used to it. Whatever will be, will be. <laughs> but I never lost uh, hope. Never lost hope. The Bank of England. This massive fortress in the heart of London has financed Britain's wars for 300 years. In 1942, Hitler made it a prime target not for bombs, but for a silent weapon that would infiltrate the vaults by stealth and destroy the credibility of the British pound. At Sachsenhausen concentration camp north of Berlin, just 30 Jewish prisoners were initially employed on the project. Isolated from the rest of the camp by barbed wire, their task was to forge pound notes good enough to fool the experts at the Bank of England. Forgery had never really been a problem. The bank was a little bit complacent about the design of its notes and the production of them. They were printed on one side only, in black ink. It was beautifully handmade paper, a very attractive watermark in it, but technologically a very simple note. And as we know, <laughs> at the time it, was, it was, wasn't too difficult to forge quite successfully. The first problem was the paper. The British pound was made from rags, pulped and shredded, to produce a paper that still had a slight texture of cloth. The Germans started using new linen, whereas the British, for the genuine notes, were using old rags from a variety of sources, including odd things like corset cuttings and uh, all sorts of things. Um, the paper looked right initially, um, but it didn't feel right. Tests to replicate the British paper were conducted at the famous Hanna Müller paper mill near Hanover. Here, SS guards sealed off an entire wing to protect their secret. They collected together all the rags they had, the new linen, and uh, sent it out to local factories where they were used for sort of industrial wipes and cleaning. Then they were brought back to the mill and uh, washed and cleaned, um, much as the British would have done it and this, this pr produced uh, fibre of the right sort of quality and character. When we took it in our hands, you could feel the difference, and we were trained for that, that the sounding of the paper was like paper and not like a rag which the British pounds were supposed to be. Another problem was the watermark, formed by laying a wired pattern on top of the wet pulp. Watermarking is a very complex science because paper shrinks as it dries. It is a wet process. So you have to make your watermark slightly bigger. You have to beat the fibre so that it will shrink at a particular rate to a particular point. Uh, you have to be able to consistently make the paper shrink to exactly the right size so that the watermark itself, uh, all of this, relates and registers correctly with the printing. In the German paper, the watermark is more noticeable in ordinary light, and that's one of the most obvious giveaways. From Hanna Müller, the watermarked paper was sent direct to Sachsenhausen for printing. Jack Plappler was one of the first group of prisoners to be employed here. I had to stand and stand by these machines for hours and hours to check that the serial numbers were printed in the right order and were not duplicated. We didn't talk when we were working because we had to keep our eyes on the printing. We had to concentrate. 
durften ja, wir mussten ja sehr gut aufpassen. That was all we ever did. We just stood there the whole time. And there always was the noise of the machinery. Wie die, wie die, wie pop, 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 wie das immer geht. To improve the workmanship, Kruger scoured the camps for illustrators and designers. One he found was the artist Peter Edel, who varied his work on the fake pounds by making secret sketches of his fellow inmates hidden from the SS guards and preserved throughout the war. I was very lucky that my best friend was Peter Edel. He was a big painter for his young years. He had very high grading on the artist. And he made hundreds of pictures in a concentration camp from his prison bodies. And here's a picture from me. Looks like a cartoon picture, how I stay under cold water in our shower room on December the 7th. And then up on the top, it shows how my dream was always bicycle racing. Artists such as Peter Edel worked directly on the printing plates to improve the fine detail. The delicate imagery of Britannia needed constant attention. The only figurative engraving was Britannia. Britannia was not there, funnily enough, originally as a, an anti-forgery device, but she became one. The eyes of Britannia were particularly bad, and I don't know quite why they got that so wrong. Britannia was the most difficult thing to print. We were told to use a pin, which we were given, to make believe they were attached together and making pinholes on top left was the best way to hide imperfections in our printing. One of the reasons for having the raw portrait on our notes today is that it's more difficult for a forger to reproduce a face. To improve the quality of the forgeries, Kruger brought in a professional crook. Solly Smolianov, a Russian Jew, had been convicted of forging British pound notes before the war. I remember the day when Zoli came to our workshop. Uh, uh, Bernard Krüger uh, introduced him to us very short but very strict. Krüger was so pleased to have Zoli working for him that he said, that man here, I take my hat off to him. He is the master counterfeiter. And Zoli was uh, a little guard. He was shown British pounds right away. And uh, he was amazed how good a job we do. And we looked at him like he was really uh, the governor of the Bank of England, and he knew exactly how they should look like. When he came into their midst, they had very mixed feelings. Don't forget, these were essentially a bunch of middle-class Jews. And he was a, an out-and-out crook who'd done time in penitentiaries and was a well-known international counterfeiter. He was, in fact, a criminal who had done the same work as we do, but we are not criminals. We did it for the German state and under the race. The printing was a, a bit of a problem for the Germans because initially they were um, doing it almost in laboratory conditions. Uh, and it was only when the actual forgers were involved in the process and pointed out to them that printers don't actually work that way. They do leave the lids off ink cans and, and oxygen gets at it and then, so it behaves slightly differently and they don't clean the plates as sparkling clean and it was those kind of touches that actually got made it right. During 1944 when the workshop was in full production the prisoners produced over eight million British banknotes ranging from fivers to hundred pound notes. Kruger had a room full of about 50 men checking the quality of every forgery. We had original English pounds and things to look to see what, what is nearer to the look of the, of the original. I had a, a, at least 20-20 vision to my bicycle racing. I saw more mistake, so he made me to a money sorter to inspect the other people's work down there. So that was my job till that end in Sachsenhausen. Little knives were given to us to try to get out the wood if we found pieces of wood in the paper which were never contained in the original British pounds. Yeah, this note is a forged one. This is here right away. Because of the F and off, right away, everybody sees it's no good. You can see this is a forged note. 
the F on off has a wasn't a, a normal F, but the F was like this. Yeah? Yeah, this note is a pouch drum. The prisoners in the sorting room pass the notes from hand to hand, folding and refolding them to make them look as if they've been in circulation for some time. Kruger was continually expanding his operation. By the end of 1944, he had 140 prisoners working in Sachsenhausen in two adjacent blocks. But so long as they did as he wished, Kruger was prepared to make their lives as easy as possible within the camp system. Kruger realized what a position he was in, and his only hope was to befriend the prisoners and get them to cooperate. Otherwise, they could sabotage the goddamn thing every day. We must admit that we did a fair good job in collaborating with the Germans against our will. Everybody was almost proud of their job, what they do, is sorting the money out or printing the money. Nobody would make a bad job, so there was no sabotage. My impression of Kruger, first of all, was surprising. He never said to us, you Jew and so on. He spoke on a normal way. I must admit that. I don't know if he killed other Jews outside who ordered killing, but with us, he wanted cooperation, and he got it, and with no alternative. The guards at Sachsenhausen were notoriously brutal. There were daily hangings, floggings, and casual executions. But in blocks 18 and 19, prisoners and guards had a very different relationship, more akin to workers and foremen. And on Saturday nights, there was cabaret. When the SS asked for entertainment, it was on Saturday night, and those of us who were capable had to comply with it, Thomas Fuhr Kruger had foreseen that, and he also took to Saxon Northern some musicians, like Hans Blas, for instance. He gave him an accordion. And then we arranged these evenings. We would stand on the most expensive stage in the world. We always used to say that. We stood on the wooden crates inside of which lay the pound notes. When Hans Blas plays with the accordion, known German, Austrian songs, people automatically got into it and sang with them. The SS, of course, were privileged. We were not in the same category as the SS. They had reserved seats in front, and we were allowed to sit in, and the music gets you involved, and I must admit, we even enjoyed it, and we had a laugh there. But it was obviously somebody that says, when we might have a laugh, and if we have one. But the prisoner's survival was linked with doing a good job for the fatherland. In the workshop, there was no room for slackers. Those who fell sick were taken outside and shot. It happened to a young, very nice boy by the name of Sukenik. He took sick and he was murdered because they couldn't take him outside to be treated in case he would talk about what we do. Always there was the knowledge that they were entirely at the mercy of the SS. We were always scared in Sachsenhausen. As long as Torbenfuhrer Kruger needs us, we hoped we'll stay alive. But once he doesn't need us, it's finished with our life. And they said it to us openly. That was our greatest problem and worry, that they would do us in, kill us at once, because we knew such great secrets. Under the constant threat of execution, the prisoners eventually succeeded in producing near-perfect forgeries. These are some of the best ever done. There were four grades they graded these notes in, in to four qualities, and grade one and are extraordinary. They are very, very close indeed. Grade two are pretty good, in fact, probably better than uh, any of the forgeries you see of banknotes these days. You English. Bank of England, the they were so well made that even the Bank of England thought they were genuine. Imagine 
Should I be proud of that? <laughs> the Bank of England, the Bank of England thought they were genuine. Good enough to fool the Bank of England, the Bernhardt forgeries would certainly have deceived the man on the street. And by 1943, the Germans could have swamped Britain with millions of high-quality forgeries. But the order never came. Why didn't the Germans drop the forged Bank of England notes over Britain? I'm really not sure. Um, big mistake, you could say. In fact, the SS had come up with what they considered to be a better plan. A plan that would dramatically increase their iron grip on Europe and make some of them very rich. By 1943, the Jewish prisoners working on Operation Bernhard had produced millions of fake British banknotes. But they could only guess what happened to them when they left the secret workshop. In fact, Every month, the fakes were taken 800 miles under armed guard to a castle in the Italian Alps. Schloss Labers, overlooking the resort town of Merano, was the distribution center for the fake Bernhard millions and the headquarters of the man charged with the operation, a financial wheeler dealer called Friedrich Schwend. He was a, a very shrewd businessman, and he came with the idea that you can use the money and instead of giving it away. Friedrich Schwend was ideally placed to put his idea into practice. A Nazi opportunist with important contacts in both the SS and the criminal underworld, he was a man who knew the value of money, especially if he had people to make it for him. He persuaded his high-ranking Nazi contacts to use the Bernhard millions not to wreck the British economy, but to bankroll the German war effort. They didn't have enough money to buy materials. They were very crucial for their economy for the war. You had to have uh, foreign currency. So he offered uh, another possibility of laundering this money, using it to buy with it different kind of goods, all, all kind of goods, and then with these goods, then selling them again for real money. In 1943, Hitler's armies were in retreat and the fortunes of the Reich in terminal decline. The German mark was worth only one fortieth of the British pound, and unlike sterling, it was not recognized as an international currency. But the fake pounds at Schloss Labers could be used to buy vital war supplies for the Reich. And for every counterfeit pound he laundered, Schwend and his agents took 33 and a third percent. Friedrich Schwend, on one hand, um, was a convinced Nazi, but on the other hand, um, he also worked together with Jewish people. Many of his agents were of Jewish origin, and he tried to do everything to protect them. In order to launder the money, once he got the green light, he contacted people who he obviously knew, had known beforehand, people with international connection in different kind of criminal activity. Part of them were respectable bankers. Uh, because you, are, you have to be uh, kind of talented in, in order to, uh, to convince people to, to, take, to trust you. Before the war, Schloss Labers, Schwenz's heavily guarded distribution center, had been a luxury hotel run by the grandfather of the present owner, Jörg Stapf. My grandfather, had to give it to the SS as a headquarter for them. We know that all the money was kept inside in different places and stored, like not the same way as in the Bank of England, most probably, but we, I will show you where. This is one of the storerooms, and uh, we still use it, but at that time, you can imagine, with all the, the money stored, it looked another sort of way. The whole property was very close protected. There was an SS guard, and the SS guard would shoot anybody, especially at night, who would uh, come here without uh, notice. One day they shoot a person near the castle. It was a, a farmer who got too close to the castle and didn't uh, explain himself, so he was shot. Schwend was having a good war. 
his castle stuffed with money and replenished by a million British banknotes a month, he was in a unique position to entertain friends. And a world removed from the source of his wealth at Sachsenhausen, where the Jewish prisoners labored to keep Schwend and his agents in the manner to which they had become accustomed. I think he was a real gambler. He was an agent, a typical agent and a gambler in one person. He was certainly a playboy. He always had the need of money and uh, was interested in, in nice girls. They chose the best rooms, of course. They had their own carpets and their own pictures. We don't know where they got them from. And nothing stayed here. They left with all. Schwent was a man who liked very much life. He had his own horse or two horses here. While management enjoyed the profits, life on the production line was less comfortable. We had no breakfast. We didn't stop for lunch. I think we had some colored water, which we called chaussette in French, socks uh, from socks uh, juice. We got one loaf between five people. On special occasions or on Hitler's birthday, it was between four men. They cut the bread in half and then like this. So we got a quarter of a loaf of bread. Otherwise, we always got turnip soup when we had finished work. It stank like a pigsty from a long way off. That was the kind of soup we got. Despite these conditions, the prisoners continued the flow of fake banknotes to Schloss Lavis. They were now being used to finance SS terrorism and intelligence gathering throughout the world. One agent alone was paid one and a half million pounds in Bernhard currency for vital information about Allied war plans. And in 1943, it funded the rescue of the overthrown dictator Mussolini, helping prolong the war in Italy by 18 months. He was imprisoned, and the Germans were interested in, in, in setting him free. So they had a problem. He was hidden, and they had to locate him. So um, with the help of, uh, of this money, of uh, the faked British pounds, they were able to bribe different various uh, Italian uh, officials or, or police person or whatever, and in this way they could locate him. Schloss Labers became the Nazi Bank of England. But as Schwendt and his network distributed their fakes around the world, the real Bank of England made a startling discovery. Even as late as the 1940s, every note issued by the bank was recorded in vast leather-bound ledgers. It literally goes back centuries to the origin of the banknote, which was a receipt for coin. Somebody came in, made a deposit of coin, were given a receipt in the form of a note, a promissory note, I promise to pay Mr. XYZ or bearer the sum of, and then the amount, and that was handed back to them. The numbers were entered in the ledger as a liability on the bank. It was during this archaic process that a clerk spotted in a bundle of returned notes, one that had already been marked in the ledger as paid off. So either the one that had been paid before was a forgery, or oh, this one was a forgery, <laughs> and it turned out to be this one. And the principal of the office, on seeing this note, described it as uh, the most dangerous he'd ever seen. I think um, people understand that, that money is important during life, but it's also equally can be a matter of life and death during wartime. In the 1790s, the British forged the French revolutionary money, and it was incredibly effective. Um, by, I think, 1795, um, it was 13,500% inflation, so much so that they just withdrew the currency and burnt it in the streets. Big bonfires in uh, the centre of Paris. To avoid panic, the bank kept their discovery a secret. It was announced that to counteract the effects of the black market, no new notes above five pounds would be printed. But for the rest of the war, those in the know were in fear that millions of forged banknotes would suddenly appear on the streets of Britain. Meanwhile, at Schloss Labers, it was business as usual. But by 1944, the SS knew the war was lost. This could be fatal for the forgers of Sachsenhausen. 
The Russians were coming from the east towards Berlin, the Americans were coming from the west, and we wondered about our destiny. We were told that we'd be killed at the end, in no uncertain terms. In January 1945, with the Germans close to surrender, Bernhard Kruger was ordered to cease production and quit Sachsenhausen. The men and their equipment were loaded onto a train and sent far to the south. The relationship assessed in us was not the same anymore. I think on their side, they were wondering about the turn the war will take. And we, on the other hand, were just as anxious, not knowing they were going to kill us or not. I was learned one thing. Don't believe in anything what they say. You see it. You see it. <laughs> and we went off, far, far away to Mauthausen, in Austria. It was generally known that Mauthausen was also called Murderhausen. Mauthausen. And the camp commandant of Mauthausen did not want to take us at all. The camp was full, but eventually special quarters were made available for them. Hans Walter entered with his artist friend Peter Edel, who had continued to chronicle their journey in his sketchbook. He said, look at the closet, full of blood. So, uh, uh, hand marks. He said, put your hand on there, you can manage it. He said, it's still wet. I said, no, I don't put my hand on it. Wet, it is blood. I see nothing but bullet holes. The barracks had been cleared for Kruger's men by killing the previous inmates. Our Gestapo guards, they say, we had nothing to do with it. We need a sleeping area. And they killed the people years before you came in. Knowing this could be their own death chamber, the secret forgers awaited the decision of their SS masters. We were really in limbo. We didn't know if this means life or death for us. And so we were pleased when our leader turned up one day, Kruger, and said they now wanted to take us to Redelzip. That was a sort of satellite camp of Mauthausen. We wound up in a small place, Redelzip, where there were mountains and tunnels in the mountains, which were bomb-proof. The SS planned to continue Operation Bernhardt from fortified tunnels under the Austrian Alps. And then we had to start assembling the machines again. And so we were very happy about this because we thought they still needed us a little bit and they would therefore not do us in. We started digging and making the foundation to support our heavy equipment, printing and so on. And after we had made the foundations, another order came. Apparently, the war was turning sour, and the Germans had decided to put an end to our lives. And then came the Herr. And then Major Kruger turned up again with his escort and said, "Stop! No more." The war has come to a point where it is nearly at an end. We are now stopping. Then we had to set fire to the crates, the ones containing the pound notes. The prisoners were left with their SS guards. Kruger disappeared, and so did most of the money. In the final days of the war, Ida Weissenbacher was living on her family farm near Lake Toplitz in the Austrian mountains. At 5 a.m., two SS men came and knocked and knocked at the door. I got up with my grandfather and went outside. Hitch up your horses, they called out, because we need carts at Lake Toplitz. Ida and her neighbors were ordered to help the SS cart 70 heavy crates to the lake. As I got there, I saw that they were out there on the lake with a raft on which there were boxes. They were really panicking, it seemed, and they threw them into the lake. I said to the SS man sitting next to me, why do they throw them into the lake? He didn't know, me neither. 
Meanwhile, the prisoners were moved to yet another camp. You could see our SS became very nervous. They decided that they're going to evacuate us from Rendelzip and told us we'll go by truck, but we have only one truck at our disposal. So divide yourself in three groups, and the truck will make three trips back and forth to Ebenze, your new destination. We go without equipment. The truck carried the first two groups to Ebenze, a concentration camp deep in the Austrian mountains where thousands had been worked to death. This was to be their final destination. The order had been given to kill them all, but it stated that they must all die together, and the third group had gone missing. The truck had broken down, and they were forced to march across the mountains to Ebensee. Jack Plappler was among them. Our SS Sergeant Werner said, don't be stupid, nothing will happen to you. We only have the order to hand you over to Ebensee concentration camp. And the local people called, don't go there, you will all just be shot. We felt quite good, as you can probably imagine. Back at Ebensee, the guards knew the Americans were closing in. After two nights in the SS barracks, and the third group has not arrived, in our own SS decided to save their own skin, to be free to move around and switch their uniforms, said, let them in. Kruger's SS men handed groups one and two over to the guards at Ebensee and fled. We entered on May the 5th in the morning. This was a miracle because on the same day in the afternoon, the third group arrived. But groups one and two were already lost among the 16,000 inmates. The guards of group three decided to let their prisoners join them and make their own escape. Thanks to the precise order that the groups must die together, they had all survived. The very next day, the Americans arrived. And as it happens, the Americans actually did turn up around noon. We heard their tanks rumbling in. And from afar, we could already see the white flag in the distance. The war was really at an end. We had survived it. With the war lost, Schwendt and his agents looked to their own survival, and the Bernhard millions still had a part to play. At the end of the war, Schwendt uh, took precautions enough, first of all, to, to get a false identity, including a card saying that he is working for the International Red Cross. He understood that it's uh, getting too hot here to stay in Europe, and he decided to go away from Europe, like other Nazis, to South America. The Bernhard... Uh, Pounds were crucial for financing the flight of the Nazis. We have some evidence that uh, this money helped to convince American agents, Italian partisans, uh, to work uh, with Schwendt and his group for, let's say, a better future for these Nazis. As an SS officer, Bernhard Kruger was imprisoned by the Allies for three years and spent part of that time helping the French Secret Service forge documents and passports. In the mid-1950s, he was brought before a denazification court. Some of his former prisoners spoke in his defense. He was very good to us, but as for anything else that he may have done wrong, I couldn't say. Anyway, we signed something to say he'd been nice to us. He was a savior. He saved a lot. Admittedly, he was done for personal reasons too, but unquestionably, he had saved the lives of all those prisoners. No question about it. The money too survived, some hidden in Swiss bank accounts, the rest in the waters of Lake Toplitz, where most of it was recovered by divers in 1959. Afterwards, one of the men who recovered the boxes from the lake gave me a few pound notes as a souvenir for my help. <laughs> Had the SS stuck to their original plan, 
this money might have changed the course of the war. Instead, just a few notes remain as collector's items, souvenirs of the Nazi plan to destroy the Bank of England. As for the plotters, Friedrich Schwend escaped to Peru. He died in 1980. Bernhard Kruger took a mundane desk job at the Hahnemüller paper mill, which had once supplied the paper for Operation Bernhard. He died in 1989. After the war, Jack Plapler eventually settled in Berlin running his own decorating company. He still lives there. I was going to be an opera singer. But our dear Führer had other plans for me. Abraham Krakowski emigrated to New York. He is still married to the fiancé he thought he lost in Auschwitz. Hans Walter moved to America, settling in Ohio, where he now lives with his son and daughter. His friend, the artist and writer Peter Edel, died in Berlin in 1983. His drawings still bear witness to what he saw in Sachsenhausen. Paul Londo returned to Paris, but eventually left France. He now lives in Montreal with his wife and his memories. Without these men, all that would remain of Operation Bernhardt would be scraps of paper and theories on what might have been. The real value of the forged millions is that these men survived. Yes, miracles happen. We were supposed to be murdered by the Nazis, and we survived by a miracle. Over on Health Now, we find out if anyone will buy the husband for sale. Staying here next, though, there are more financial irregularities with the story of Brink's Matt. <laughs> 